Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Fighting rages across Sudan's southern Kordofan state. Thousands flee northern Syrian town as Damascus stages pro-Assad rally and Bahraini's march in support of political prisoners. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East, begins now. Reuters news agency quoted eyewitnesses saying that thousands of residents of the northern Syrian town of Marat Naman fled as army tanks inched towards the town. In addition, tanks were positioned in the city of Dirazur and Abu Kamal, near the border with Iraq. On the other hand, Syrian Information Minister Adnan Mahmoud called on the residents who fled to Turkey to return home. Mahmoud's statement comes as thousands of people continue to flee Jisr Shigur to the Turkish territory. This is Syrian authorities' part partially reopened the border crossing with Jordan after a two-month-long closure. Eleven years after the departure of what the Syrian regime describes as its eternal leader, his statue was removed from the heart of Hamma. The fall of Assad, the father's statue, was not caused by the hammers of the protesters this time. Instead, authorities were in charge of transporting it to an unknown site. Some say the statue found its place in a warehouse that will protect it from the anger of those demonstrating for their freedom. The symbolism of removing the statue from a corner it sat on for a long time reveals the depth of the crisis experienced by the successor of Assad the father and the regime's heir. Dissenters say the testate bestowed by the father to the son is the heavy testate of the Ba'ath party. They believe it is based on security and only security and protected by the eighth article of the Constitution, which grants the party the sole agency over ruling the country. In order to overcome this inheritance and its tyrannical effects and suppression of freedoms, the Syrians continue to take to the street across the country on a daily basis. This is the cry that confronts the barrels of cannons, since peaceful protests are frequently met with deadly gunfire. Only the regime and its media continue to repeat the story of infiltrators and conspirators allied with colonial and imperial states, descriptors borrowed from the Cold War's dictionary. The parliament salutes the efforts of our armed forces and the members of the internal security forces for executing their national duty of re-establishing security and stability in this area. In order to confront the conspiracy the regime talks about, its tanks are getting ready today to enter Marat on Naman. And the regime that announced that its deployment to the town comes in response to a request by its residents faces a clear paradox since 70 percent of those who supposedly called for the entry of the army have fled the town in fear of that same army's violence. This, according to Othman al-Badawi, a university professor and resident of the town that fears a fate similar to that of Talqalakh, Jisr Shagur, Talbisa, and Dara. The Dara that witnessed unprecedented violence at the hands of security forces continues to endure the crackdown of security men who have arrested hundreds of the province's residents. The latest is Dr. Faisal al zogbi and his colleague from the Abu Nabut family. In addition to the head of the morgue at Dara's main hospital, who is accused of writing a false report on the boy Hamza al Khatib, who was subjected to the ugliest forms of torture before being killed. This is, then, how the arrest campaign continues and is kept in pace with the advance of the Syrian army's tanks to towns and villages. And with the two, thousands flee to nearby towns or cross the border into refugee camps in Turkey in search of a calm that is only interrupted by the chirping of birds, which revives the memory of their own towns. In Damascus, the scene was different as thousands gathered to hold the longest Syrian flag in solidarity with the regime. There are no Shabiha here, or any infiltrators targeting the masses with gunfire. This is another paradox the opposition discusses. 
And in order for Syria not to become a camp for the displaced inside their nation and refugees in the nations of others, activists are calling for a protest on Friday named after Sheikh Saleh al-Ali, a historic hero of the Syrian revolution. He rebelled against French colonialism and rejected an offer to create an Alawite state separate from Syria. By choosing Saleh al-Ali as the name for Friday's protest and before him the Great Friday for its symbolism, activists seek to confirm that their mobilization for freedom is a national one that crosses narrow ethnic and sectarian lines and aims to build a free Syria, a Syria where fear has no place. The Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC, has decided to throw the ball back into the Yemeni rival's court, offering to resume its mediation efforts if requested. Meanwhile, a disagreement over the formation of the Transitional Council is continuing to grow, which may reflect negatively on the Saudi-sponsored truce being observed in the country. The revolution youths are mobilizing to form a Transitional Council, as the ultimatum given to the acting Yemeni president has expired. Abdul Rahman al -Shumar reports from Sana'a. The international efforts to resolve the Yemeni crisis have not paid off. Despite brokering a truce sponsored by mediators inside and outside Yemen, the two Yemeni rivals have failed to agree on a tentative mechanism for a peaceful transfer of authority in the country amid Saleh's absence. The two sides also failed to agree on the formation of a transitional council, as demanded by the revolution youths. The 24-hour ultimatum to form a transitional council expired yesterday. The Gulf Initiative no longer represents all sides. A new effort is being launched by the Saudi, German and Emirates ambassadors. Their vision is somewhat different than the one outlined in the Gulf Initiative. They want to include all sides in negotiations under the auspices of the European Union and the U.S. ambassadors to Sana'a. While some outside Yemen are betting on the political future of the acting Yemeni president, the opposition blocs express doubt over the ability of Abu Abu Mansour Hadi to continue to run the country's affairs, especially considering his limited authority. The opposition wants to encourage the acting president to function as if the president had signed the Gulf Initiative, telling him that he now has the authority and he can't be stripped of it. However, the acting president can't function this way, especially as many members of the regime are still in power. The sit-in groups in Chain Square have called on the GCC to support the will of the people and to help form and recognize a transitional council. The sit-in youths also called for the toppling of what they referred to as the remnants of the regime. It seems that the process of political transformation in Yemen following Saleh's ouster is very complicated, perhaps due to the presence of special interests in the region, especially with certain foreign groups who continue to reach out to the political blocs on one hand and support the aspirations of the youths of change on the other. Abdul Rahman al-Shumari, Dubai TV, Sana'a. Organizations leading the protests in Bahrain called for marches and rallies paving the way for the return to Martyrs Square, formerly known as Pearl Roundabout. A number of regions in Bahrain witnessed fresh protests. The regime's security forces confronted the protesters using live bullets and tear gas. Protests in Bahrain continue despite the crackdown on the civilians by the authorities' forces, backed by Saudi occupation forces. Residents of the Sitra region organized a march in solidarity with the detainees in Bahraini prisons. For their part, residents of Sanabis also descended on the streets to voice their support of the nation's symbols and protest the violence in Bahrain that does not spare children, women, medical personnel, or even officials, all in the pretext of participating in the popular protests. Protesters marched in the town's streets, chanting slogans to topple the government as the first conditional step before beginning any dialogue with the Bahraini government.
Protests extended in a number of regions in Bahrain. Various villages and towns in the country witnessed nightly protests condemning the international silence surrounding what is happening in Bahrain. Bahraini security forces confronted the protests with live bullets, tear gas and smoke, and hunted down protesters on the streets and in alleys. Meanwhile, Bahraini youth organizations called for descending on Pearl Roundabout, also known as Martyrs Square, to continue demanding fundamental reforms in the country. As part of a campaign to confront the media, the Bahraini authorities decided to sue the British newspaper The Independent and its renowned writer Robert Fisk for his coverage of the bloody repression practiced by the Bahraini authorities against peaceful protesters. Legally, the president of the Coalition for the International Campaign Against Impunity, Mayal Hansa is to submit a new complaint this Friday to the International Criminal Court in The Hague of the Netherlands against the Bahraini regime for committing crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide. El Hansa explained that she will discuss the final edition of the complaint with 15 European lawyers, which will be backed with irrefutable evidence and documents that confirm the truth of what is happening in Bahrain against unarmed civilians. Libyan revolutionaries have reportedly made fresh gains against regime forces in the east and west of the country. Reports say revolutionary fighters have forced regime troops into retreat from the western town of Kikla, which is about 150 kilometers southwest of the capital. The revolutionary fighters have set up defensive positions in Kikla in case of a counterattack. In the east, anti-regime forces have launched more attacks against forces loyal to Libyan ruler Muammar Gaddafi near the oil town of Brega. Meanwhile, NATO has resumed bombing of the Libyan capital with strikes hitting the east of the city. The Libyan state TV says the bombings struck military and civilian targets in Fernag, one of the biggest neighborhoods in the city. In Pakistan, at least 10 people have been killed in an unauthorized U.S. drone attack on the country's northwestern tribal region. Pakistan security officials say missiles fired by a drone hit a compound and a car near Wana, the main town of South Waziristan. Witnesses say the vehicle was destroyed completely, leaving all four occupants dead. Hundreds of people have been killed in U.S. attacks in Pakistan. Washington claims its air raids target militants, but civilians have been the main victims. Islamabad has repeatedly condemned the strikes as violation of its sovereignty. Chairman of U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff Admiral Mike Mullen says American troops will not leave Afghanistan. Mullen says the U.S. will start withdrawing some troops this summer but a continued presence is certain. U.S. President Barack Obama is expected to decide in the coming weeks how many U.S. troops should be pulled out from Afghanistan. Full responsibility is due to be turned over to the Afghans in 2014. Meanwhile, at least five foreign nationals have been injured in a helicopter crash in the eastern province of Kunar. Officials say the Afghan army helicopter went down as it was trying to land in a military base. Three of the injured were NATO translators. The Taliban have claimed responsibility for the incidents. The militants say all of those on board the chopper were killed in the crash. Elsewhere, another foreign soldier was killed in the Baltal South. The nationality of the soldier is still unknown. That death brings to at least 242 the number of foreign troops killed so far this year. An American human rights activist says the situation in a notorious prison in Afghanistan is worse than thought. Daphne Eviatar talks about her latest report on the U.S. background base and the overall situation of the detainees that are held there. She says most of the detainees are being held without charge or access to a lawyer. The United States is holding more than 1,700 detainees now at, Bag at the Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan. These are people being held without charge, without trial, without any due process. And a lot of them, from based on the research that we did, seem to have done nothing wrong. We interviewed a, a lot of people who had been detained and had been released within the last year by U.S. forces. A lot of them never knew why they were actually detained. They didn't know 
and they never saw charges against them. They never saw any evidence against them. They weren't giving lawyers an opportunity in any effort to defend themselves. Some of them were locked up for years at, at this prison. So unfortunately, the problem is growing. You know, when the when President Obama came into office, there were about 600 detainees, maybe up to 650 that had been held by the Bush administration. Now that is almost tripled. U.S. forces have also increased the number of night raids they do, so they go into compounds, they gather people up, they arrest them, they bring them to this prison, and then some of them can be left there for years before they get out, and it's not clear that they had ever done anything wrong. And then when they, then they're finally released and they go back to the village, and now you have a really resentful person, a really resentful family, and a really resentful village that increasingly feels like the United States is arbitrarily detaining people. And so you've seen in the last few years that support for U.S. forces in Afghanistan among Afghans has really gone down. There's a lot more resentment of the United States. The reasons that the U.S. military will give for doing this is they'll say, well, we have information from an informant that this person is, you know, working with the Taliban. But the informants that they rely on are often really unreliable people, and that's something we talk about in the report as well. And lots of journalists and other human rights organizations have documented this as well. هناك تصاعد في أعمال العنف في جنوب كردفان. كنا قبل فترة أيضا شهدنا. Violence escalated in Sudan, South Kordofan province. A moment ago, we saw acts of violence in the Abyei region as well. U.S. President Barack Obama warned that the United States will suspend its normalization with Sudan if violence escalates. The following report takes a look at the subject from a political standpoint. As soon as the African Union announced its tentative agreement to transform Abyei into a demilitarized zone, the South Kordofan province turned into another center of tension amongst many centers of endless tension between the north and south of Sudan. The Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, hosted closed-door negotiations between Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir and the president of southern Sudan, Salva Kiir. The negotiations resulted in a peace agreement and discussed the proposal to send Ethiopian peacekeeping forces to to Abyei. In addition to African mediation efforts, this achievement of understanding was also attributed to the pressure exerted by the U.S. administration. Recent developments along the border, particularly in the Abyei region, are deeply troubling. The two sides should find a peaceful solution to the lingering issues in the peace agreement and not resort to violence. Once again, the African Union played a decisive role in facilitating the negotiations in Sudan. Less than a day after this development, reports indicated that Sudanese forces launched heavy raids on the South Kordofan province, located near the border between the north and the south. The United Nations warned of a deteriorating humanitarian situation in the region and held Khartoum responsible for hindering relief efforts. UN sources spoke of heavy shelling targeting an airstrip that almost hit the UN building. Khartoum completely denied the allegation. A spokesman for the Sudanese army responded by saying that the operations exclusively targeted the rebels and did not harm any civilians. The reports say that the shelling expanded to include areas that are home to members of several popular movements. Most of the residents of these areas are from Nubian communities that helped southern Sudan during the civil war between the north and the south. They accused the authorities in Khartoum of adopting an ethnic cleansing policy in South Kordofan against the Nubian ethnic group with help from militias loyal to the regime. Sadiq Abu Hassan, BBC. We open with reports that organizers of this month's planned aid flotilla to Gaza are now considering postponing the mission due to increasing tensions along the Syrian Turkish border. A spokesman for the ship told Turkey's Hurriyet newspaper today that the flotilla organizers from the IHH say that it cannot close its eyes to developments on Turkey's doorstep. Ahead of today's announcement, those planning the flotilla insisted they are not seeking a confrontation with Israel and have asked Turkish Jews to relay that message to the Jewish state. 
Nine Turkish extremists were killed last year when they attacked a boarding party of Israeli commandos as the Turkish ship Mavi Marmara tried to run the Gaza blockade. All regulations have been defined before. If anybody is in the law, if it is the legal, no one has a right to say go or stop. It is the security problem. They say that with the flotillas, they will carry some things, weapons, bombs, to be used against the Israeli peoples. If it is the reason for the Israelis, we are opening to our boats for the search of the United Nations or any international bodies in independent port. They can come, they can see. We are not carrying something against the security of Israel. If the UN tells you we will take the goods and we will uh, transport it to Gaza, is it fine with you? If it is from the sea, there is no problem. Israel's diplomatic offensive continued today as the nation's leaders tried to persuade visiting European diplomats that a unilateral declaration of Palestinian statehood must not be recognized by the United Nations in September. IBA reporter Eli Wagelant has been following developments. Eli? Yes, it's a diplomatic frenzy this week as a number of foreign statesmen are here to meet with Israeli and Palestinian officials on two main tracks. One is the question of recognition of Palestinian statehood at the United Nations in September. And on a parallel track is a renewed effort by the United States to get Israel and the Palestinians back to the table for talks and in that way head off the U.N. vote. Top White House Middle East advisor Dennis Ross met this morning with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and declared outright that Israel and the Palestinian Authority must accept two states for two people in the land of Israel. The visit is Ross's first to the region since Special Envoy George Mitchell resigned last month after he failed to break the negotiations deadlock. Ross is accompanied by David Hale, who had served as Mitchell's deputy as, and is now acting, acting Mideast Envoy. The trip is seen as building on the meetings Hale held with Palestinian negotiator Saeb Arakat and Netanyahu's special envoy Yitzhak Molcho in Washington last week. Also here is German Foreign Minister Guido Westerwell, who met last night with Netanyahu and Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman. Netanyahu was quoted as saying that he hopes to convince at least 30 countries to vote against recognizing a Palestinian state should the United Nations debate the issue in September. This diplomatic offensive is part of Israel's plan to secure the moral majority during the anticipated vote at the UN. Said Netanyahu, there will not be a majority of countries who oppose recognition, but a balance will be achieved. After meeting with Lieberman, Vestivel said, we are calling on all sides to be flexible and not be hesitant, but to start negotiations. The Palestinians, and especially the residents of the Gaza Strip, hoped that national reconciliation between Fatah and Hamas would lead to an improvement in their conditions and situation. However, Israel has placed an obstacle in front of the realization of the Palestinians' hopes. Indeed, the Israeli siege on the Gaza Strip today is comprehensive as it enters its fifth year with the closure of most of the Strip's crossings with Israel. In addition, the sea and air sieges continue to suffocate the residents of Gaza. In between these narrow alleys, a mixture of bitterness and pain presents itself. Severe poverty is mixed with the harshness of life, and dreams collide with a lack of possibilities. Bloody images come together to embody a painful humanitarian tragedy whose features were completed in the besieged Gaza Strip. Small in size, but great in significance. Only those whose fate led them to walk the streets of Gaza can feel the immense suffering. The occupation ogre has been mercilessly controlling the Strip for five consecutive years, completely ignoring international regulations. The siege is suffocating us. We're dying because of the siege. By God, we used to drink, come and go, visit each other and go places. But now there's nothing, nothing at all. There isn't any possibility to do anything. Since the purpose of the siege is to kill all of life's opportunities in the Strip, the occupation retains a policy that deliberately impoverishes the 1.5 million human beings who reside in this narrow coastal Strip and forces hundreds of thousands of people capable of working to live in poverty. Today, five years after the siege began, the situation is escalating. There's a sea, air, and land siege on the entire Strip. Israel especially targets fishermen. They are enduring horrible treatment at the hand of the Jews, and fishing conditions are worsening. There is no work. No one has a job.
As this fisherman sadly recounts his tragic story after the occupation's siege impacted him, this university student's ambition to complete his education also lies in doubt as job opportunities dissipated in light of a collapsing economy. Every year, there are about 40,000 people who graduate and just sit at home. Why do they stay at home? Because there is no work and you need to have connections even for unemployment. Despite the numerous pleas and appeals, the Palestinians have cried out to the world in order to lift this oppression that affects all aspects of life, the tragic reality becomes increasingly severe. And while the darkness of the crisis deepens, the Palestinians' will strengthens. They've decided that those living under siege with dignity are more proficient in the language of resistance than the enemy's language of siege and aggression. Joining us over the phone from Gaza is Dr. Samir Abu Mdalala, the head of the economic department at Al-Azhar University. Dr. Samir, the siege on Gaza is entering its fifth year. In your opinion, what are the economic and social repercussions of this siege? Certainly, since June 2006, when Israel imposed its land, sea, and air siege on the Gaza Strip and took control of the crossings. This led to the deterioration of the economic situation and increased the suffering of the residents of Gaza. This led the unemployment and poverty rates to triple. As we are aware, the unemployment rate in Gaza has reached about 40 to 45 percent, and the poverty and extreme poverty levels combined have reached nearly 70 percent. The comprehensive siege has also inflicted damage on all of the economic sectors of the Strip, some of which have collapsed, such as the manufacturing and agriculture sectors. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Firedall Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.